Yeah, I'd like to start off by saying um, uh, it'd be good if GPs, uh, yes, we know they're so under pressure and have a million and one conditions to think about, but it'd be really good if they could merge their medical way of looking at things with with the emotional and practical advice that they can give you know with dementia all they can do is give us a pill but actually they can do so much more they can they can sign posters to the emotional and practical support that we need which is far more important to us than that pill you know at that, at that moment in time yes if, if they're going to prescribe an pill or whatever it is then fair enough but at the time to us the most important thing is emotional and practical support and by signposting us to to groups like ours and courses like ours that, that have been created and delivered by people with dementia it helps people to see that there's a life after diagnosis right um what i was going to say was it's all right getting we get diagnosed and then that's it i think it would be nice that whenever the, you go to your doctor you're asked how you're coping. Now, I'm not on no tablet or anything. And for five years, six years nearly now, I've had dementia. And it was only a month ago that I had to mention at the doctors that nobody's sort of said, how are you coping? And so the doctor then made an appointment for me to have a chat with her. But they just seem to forget about, once you've they've diagnosed you, they forget about you. Where any other, other disease, they talk here, there and everywhere. Just like you've got to mention our scram and that's it. Thanks, Eddie. That, that, that taps into Wendy's point about that sort of um, emotional and practical support. I'd just like to ask the group if anybody uh, wants to say what has been uh, a really good practical support for you following your diagnosis? I'll come to Bob. Yeah, we, we've been fortunate because we, fairly early times, we were, we were involved with some research and that was really helpful because two lovely ladies came to see us and talked us through things and that really just sort of softened the blow of having to say, well, I've got dementia, well, dementia is dementia, but, you know, in the, in the first instance, that was really, really helpful and we're very grateful to those And Wendy's ladies. talk. And Wendy's yeah. looks and things <laughs> just... Phenomenal because she's just such a, I don't know, inspirational lady. Oh, big one. And Tibble, yeah. No. <laughs> Thanks. Well, we all know it, really, Wendy. We all know it. I think we've been three or four times, really, to the same mm. talk, yeah. but it's always oh. different. Yeah. You're groupies now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Elaine, you've got your card up there? Unmute. Eric to the rescue. Minds and voices is the best thing that's ever happened to me. It's given me my life back. Before we were. <laughs> but um, just being able to talk about it has been a great relief to Sue. Um, you know, before. Well, first of all, reading Wendy's book, so to refer to that again, I mean, that was fantastic. I was just by chance I came across that. I, and then, obviously, within the book, it refers to Minds and Voices, and then contact with Damien. But I think it's also meant that we could open up with the family much more, uh, whereas I think we were a bit secretive about all this until we got confidence to talk to the family. And now everybody, and Sue's talking to her friends more now about the situation. And finds it a big relief, I think, mm. don't you? Yes, it's it's more normal because at, at the beginning you you don't want to fluster about something or forget something, and it's all mm. an embarrassment. And 
how are you going to cope with that sort of thing? Um, but it's it's much better now. And and coming here, you know, with a group, uh, say we 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 well, I laugh all the time and, and go home. Well, I, I'm home, but, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> afterwards, you know, think well, that was great. And there's so many other people mm. who are similar, um, and and it's really boosted me up with confidence. And as as mm. Roland said, I, I'm quite happy now to say to people, well, look, I've got dementia coming, or I've got it. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm accepting it rather than before, sort of, as I say, hiding it and uh, scared, being scared about it. But there we are. So <laughs> I think maybe just one point to, to Sheila, particularly, uh, is that our, um, we've, we've already explained this to Damien, but when we first plucked up courage, you might say, to go to the GP, um, we felt it was a very uh, sort of clinical and rigid approach um not very empathetic and it it put sue off a lot actually because we went in for our 10 minute session normal gp appointment and um after five minutes the gp pulled out of the filing cabinet a, a test which she then obviously had to fill in or talk about and it was all a bit poof you know quick and Suddenly we were being tested and talking about losing driving licenses and things like that. And it, we came away scared, actually, and we were both a bit taken aback, to be honest. But, but, then we had but since then, it's been very good because yeah. we've been referred to the uh, mental health unit in Nesbra and uh, we've been through. Um, good, yeah, so, yeah, so two very good, um, you know, a lot of empathy mm. in the actual follow up. But initially, initially a bit scary, to be honest. Mm. Wendy. Yeah, it's often just the clinical language that the the GPs use. I mean, yes, it's their speak every day, isn't it? But if they could concentrate less on what they, they you know, they can't do anything, but they concentrate on that. You know, they concentrate on our failures. You know, this test to see how bad we do. Uh, this test that we have to repeat every then, now and then to see how worse we've got. And it's concentrating on all the negative. And if only they could concentrate. I mean, yes, I can see the purpose of the tests, but if they could balance that with concentrating on what we can do and what life we still have and what you know what, what we can still offer, then, you know, that would balance the negativity that we come out feeling. You often come out feeling really depressed because they've just told you, I don't know, you've scored 21 points instead of 25. But they don't tell you how to compensate for the bits of the brain that have stopped working. They don't give you any advice on how to cope with that bit so we need a balance of the 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 natural negativity that is uh, the test or uh, um, anything else like that might might bring to us but we need to balance that with positivity as well hello um barbara in over the three years that she's had was diagnosed with dementia, has never seen a doctor from our practice in three years. Barbara's diagnosis came through having an eye test. As I said earlier, Barbara's never seen a GP. So, you know, rest my case. Thanks, thanks Colin for that. Um, you know, that, that just stresses how the different ways that people come to getting a diagnosis. And I've never known anyone have the same pathway um, so certainly consistency is something. Wendy? Yeah, it's that consistency that's missing. Every, every GP I've seen has dealt with me totally differently. There's never been any consistent um, pathway, as, as Damien said. Um, I left my previous GP because uh, he, 
he insisted that denezepil didn't work. So why was I bothering to take it? But as I said to him, that, you know, if, if that was the only lifeline you had, would you not take it? And of course, I found a new GP then. But uh, my new GP treated me differently after reading my book, which I know is, is me uh, uh, not showing off, but whatever it is. Uh, she, she suddenly started taking her time with me. She suddenly started writing down what she'd said to me. And so now we have a routine when I go that I take my little notebook with why I've gone, because I often forget what the hell I'm there for, but she'll write down the answers so I can show my daughters. So it's little things like that, little adaptions that she has made for me. However, with the COVID time, I felt abandoned by my GP because there's been no access to video calling and I can't use the phone. So, again, it's that adapting to people's needs. It's not us having to fit in with what the GP sees as the best method, but asking people how they need to be contacted, how how best to perform the consultation when we can't do it in person. Um, something that was mentioned there, that, that sort of information, uh, what struck me about Barbara and Colin uh, and also um, Roland and Sue, that so many people leave the, that, that appointment when they get the diagnosis with something vague about uh, an incurable illness and driving and powers of attorney ringing in their ears and not much more. So, you know, there is so much more. Minds and Voices is only small. It'd be brilliant to have a network of Minds and Voice groups across Yorkshire because everyone can't come to our group. Um, um, going back to, to Sheila's original request about, okay, let, let's convince the GPs it is worthwhile diagnosing and diagnosing in, in, a, in a sensitive, balanced manner. Um, let's give them something in terms of to put in that balance sheet, if you want. Um, Barbara, you were mentioning uh, Minds and Voices and, and what it means to you before we, we started recording. Um, what's your favourite day of the week? Mondays. <laughs> Uh, for the purpose of recording, today is a Monday. Um, <laughs> tell us what you think about Minds and Voices, Barbara. It's changed our lives. Um, all my friends, um, because they don't see me in any different light at all, so they don't think there's anything going on in my head or not going on at times, because um, I've got five friends, all of whom are widows, and so they've set up their own group, and I understand that. But the thing is, um, I've been out with them a couple of times, and I'm just lost nowadays because the things that was, you know, the things that we all did together, including the husbands and Colin and everything, but it's all a different way now, and I appreciate that. That isn't. The problem, I just find it sad that there's no connection anymore. Oh, don't set me off. Wendy. There's nothing more comforting than being with a group of people that understand and can laugh together and cry together and just be together and just be what we are when when we're when we're out in in the world then we have this invisible disability that other people can't see and don't understand but being with people that are going through the same emotions and the same 
or similar difficulties. It's just like being wrapped up in a big family. And that's what Minds and Voices is. That's a, it's our other family that we can say anything to. And no one judges, no one contradicts, no one thinks anything of anything. Because we are just being who we are. And there's very few circumstances in which you can act like that. And Minds and Voices is one of them. And our course, when we did our course and new people came, then it showed them that, you know, they were suddenly saying, oh, well, we didn't realise that. You know, we didn't... We, you, you're laughing. Who's got the dementia in this room? Wendy, thank you so much. You know, talking about the practical things, the, the undaunting and the safe space that Minds and Voices is, and, and, and the course. Eddie, you were part of the... Eddie and Paul and Elaine and Wendy uh, were all tutors on the course. You created the course content yourselves in discussion. Um, essentially the message is about building confidence and, and being amongst peers um, but a really powerful learning. Wendy's waving madly, Wendy. Yeah, because I've on. got to go get my bus. I've just <laughs> realised the time. I need to get a wiggle on. <laughs> what, what we need to do is get together and make a list of different places where people that have got dementia can go to. Now, Minds and Voices to me is the best thing that ever happened, but there's not just Minds and Voices. All through the week, there's different places that I go to, and we're all treat the same, like we do at Minds and Voices. And we need a list in the surgeries to say, if you want to meet other people with dementia, these are the places to go to. And this is what we need to have. I mean, I I've just been listening to, to you all talking about uh, getting different treatments at the doctors. I get nothing. Nobody, I haven't been retested since I got diagnosed. So, you know, what's going on? Eddie, thanks for that. Um, that list you talk about, uh, there was certainly one created um, by Healthwatch. Um, Anna, do you want to share us a little bit about that? that that's a great document that, yeah, as, as Eddie said, everyone should be able to have access to. And that was a collation of all the sort of the key key services. Yeah, we've got one here. Yeah. I think um, I think actually some of you guys worked on on them bringing this together. So uh, it, it needs another it needs another uh, edition to bring it up to date. But it's a very good document that's got a lot of information in it, including signposting to different services. But as with anything, it's good to have a physical copy that people can read, but it needs to be kept updated. Um, I, I think, as is for Sheila really, uh, again, I think the NHS has got some very good examples of how things perhaps should be done in the mental health area, because if you look at cancer and how quickly they fast track somebody with cancer and the supporting services that go with cancer when you they tell you what life will be like. I, I, I was unfortunate in having, having prostate cancer, which fortunately was cured, but the actual support that Sue and I both had in the diagnostic stage and all the analysis about what life could and would be like afterwards and the support groups, being able to chat to people who had also been through the same experience, I thought was absolutely fantastic. It was, it was so, it was such a good pathway, which is the expression I suppose we use, um, which I just think is missing with dementia and mental health issues. So, so it does exist, the model exists, but it's just some, some, somehow isn't used for mental health. Me? I just, no, I just wanted to say, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to say that um, Bob's just got his driving license for another year. So it ran out in March, but uh, it didn't come back all over lockdown. So, um, you can still drive, you know, Bob's a very safe driver, doesn't know where he's going usually, but, <laughs> um, with support, you know, with me there, he's absolutely fine. 
and I want to hold on to that. And it, the GP was going to, they have to fill in a form at the surgery. And we don't know any of our GPs now. They thought all the people we knew had left. And so I really got in touch with the surgeon and said, we wanted to be involved in that form because how can they possibly um, make a decision about a man that they don't know and have never, ever seen? Monica. Yes. We were t talking this morning about dementia. Yes. And you said it sort of, there's a, a, got a negative connotation, isn't there, about it? I think it? so, yes. What, what's been good for you in well, terms of... Well, I think of... the word memory loss is descriptive mm. and it doesn't seem to have a, a, a label that dementia has as if you're going around tearing your hair, shouting out. <coughs> Yes, so it's, the, a, it's a silent thing, not a, a noisy, intrusive thing, isn't it? Yeah, I like that. That that. So, yes, the, there's that image that people have of, of of dementia being sort of people doing all sorts of irrational things, and as you say, just, just call it memory loss. That's what it is. And that's certainly the main issue for you, isn't it, Monica? Yes, I think yeah, so. Yeah. And what's helped you? <laughs> Damien. <laughs> There's a fiver. <laughs> you know, having a professional that, that is in charge and, and knows the issues and uh, any help that can be um, called upon, that's what would help. Or well, shall we finish with a bit of a tune mm, on yes. the old piano? Right, what would you like? <laughs> 